Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday. Um, looks like we had some new features on Zoom that we're going to have to start getting used to. Um, so that's always fun. A few, a couple announcements for us. Uh, first of all, a very special thank you to Deb Huffman, who did our Pentecost graphics this morning that you're seeing either on your screen or projected up on the wall. Uh, she's been doing all the graphics that we've been using throughout our virtual worship services. So a very special thank you to her. Um, another big announcement, um, as I announced last Sunday, um, Session has approved our next phase for moving sort of toward returning back towards more or less normal for the life of the church. So starting this morning, the sanctuary is now open to 50 people. Masks and social distancing are still required. Light kind of soft singing and responding to the readings within your mask is welcomed. We're going to begin to offer a social time without any food or drink out on the patio beginning after this service. Um, our registration system is a lot more simple now. Um, as you arrive to the into the building, you will have your temperature checked and be asked a few health questions. But aside from your initial visit, we're not going to do the paperwork anymore. Um, you're no longer required to call Deb to reserve a spot in the sanctuary. Um, and if you're not feeling well on a particular day, if you normally like to do this in person, or if like me, you live 800 miles away now, uh, please, please join us over Zoom, where we will continue uh, this multi sort of in-person kind of virtual hybrid worship experience. And now friends, on this birthday of the church, let's worship God. The Spirit of God renews the earth. Bless the name of the Lord. Let us worship the Lord. Praise and glory to you, Creator Spirit of God. You make our bread the communion of Christ's body to heal and reconcile, and to make us the body of Christ. You make our wine the communion of Christ's saving blood to redeem the world. You are the truth. You come like the wind of heaven, unseen, unbidden. Like the dawn, you illuminate the world around us. You grant us a new beginning every day. You warm and comfort us. You give us courage and fire and strength beyond our everyday resources. Be with us, Holy Spirit, in all we say, or think in all we do, this and every day. Amen. Amen.
Please join us in the litany for Pentecost. Holy Spirit, creator, in the beginning you moved over the waters. From your breath, all creation drew life. Without you, life turns to dust. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, counselor, by your inspiration, the prophets spoke and acted in faith. You clothed them in power to be bearers of your word. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, power. You came as fire to Jesus' disciples. You gave them voice before the rulers of this world. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, sanctifier. You created us children of God. You make us the living temple of your presence. You intercede with us, in us with sighs too deep for words. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, giver of life. You guide and make holy the church you create. You give gifts, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and piety, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that the whole creation may be transformed. Come, Holy Spirit. True and only light, from whom comes every good gift, send your spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind. Open the horizons of our minds by the flame of your wisdom. Loosen our tongues to show your praise. For only in your spirit can we voice your words of peace and acclaim Jesus as Lord. Amen. Jesus says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Trusting in God's grace, let us tell the truth about ourselves. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples created bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God, Transform our timid lives by the power of your spirit and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us for the forgiveness of sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And friends, as we have been forgiven in Christ, let us seek reconciliation with all of our neighbors. May the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you.
let us pray. God of power and grace, fill us with the wisdom of your word and the understanding of your spirit so that we may be your church, a people with dreams and visions at work in all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will speak of God's deeds of power in our own language. Hear the word of the Lord. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. This is a familiar passage to most of us, and the Lord's Spirit has come down to speak with Ezekiel. The Lord's power overcame me, and while I was in the Lord's Spirit, he led me out and set me down in the middle of a certain valley. It was full of bones. He led me through them all around, and I saw that there were a great many of them on the valley floor, and they were very dry. He asked me, human one, can these bones live again? I said, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to these bones, I am about to put breath in you and you will live again. I will put sinews on you, place flesh on you and cover you with skin. When I put breath in you and you come to life, you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesied just as I was commanded. There was a great noise as I was prophesying, then a great quaking, and the bones came together, bone by bone. When I looked, suddenly there were sinews on them. The flesh appeared and they were covered over with skin, but there was still no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy human one, say to the breath. The Lord God proclaims, come from the four winds breath, breathe into these dead bodies and let them live. I prophesied just as he commanded me. When the breath entered them, they came to life and stood on their feet, an extraordinarily large company. He said to me, human one, these bones are the entire house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely finished. So now prophesy and say to them, the Lord God proclaims, I'm opening your graves. I will raise you up from your graves, my people, and I will bring you to Israel's fertile land. You will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves, and raise you up from your graves. My people, I will put my breath in you and you will live. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. This is what the Lord says. Our second reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter eight, verses 22, through 27. We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the creation. We ourselves, who have the spirit as the first crop of the harvest, also groan inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved in hope. 
If we see what we hope for, that isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. The one who searches hearts knows how the Spirit thinks because he pleads for the saints consistent with God's will. The word of the Lord. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me third reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John in chapter 15 verses 26 through 27 and continuing in chapter 16 from the second half of verse 4 to verse 15. When the companion comes whom I will send from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You will testify too, because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told you about them. I didn't say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. 
but now I go away to the one who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Yet because I have said these things to you, you are filled with sorrow. I assure you that it is better for you if I go away. If I don't go away, the companion won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will show the world it was wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. He will show the world it was wrong about sin because they don't believe in me. He will show the world it was wrong about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you won't see me anymore. He will show the world it was wrong about judgment because this world's ruler stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He won't speak on his own, but he will say whatever he hears and will proclaim to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and proclaim it to you. Everything that the father has is mine. That's why I say that the spirit takes what is mine and will proclaim it to you. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thanks be to God. Today in worship, friends, we celebrate a very important birthday, the birthday of the church. Happy birthday, us and every other communal expression of the followers of Jesus going back to the first century CE. One of the ways that I that we are celebrating what is probably my favorite holiday on the church calendar, um, aside from all this red, of course, is through hearing an alternative to the story in Acts that I've preached on perhaps more than any other text in what is, as of today, uh, my seven years in ordained ministry. This morning, we hear from the Gospel of John, which I think is pretty appropriate for today because, well, for starters, we've just finished up that Eastertide series going through the letter, the epistle written to that community from which John emerged about a generation or so after. And also because, as biblical scholarship often likes to point out, John is the weird one. And since we're talking about the spirit today, I find that quite appropriate. Think on it. On this birthday, we celebrate the gift that Jesus left to Jesus's people, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the counselor, the comforter, the spirit of truth, she who is with us, that still small voice, the wild goose, the mighty wind, wisdom herself, the flame, the dove. This most quiet member of our triune God is, well, rather strange. When we think to the Trinity, as hopefully we often do, and we especially will be doing next Sunday, and we think of those three persons that our theological heritage describe, describes them, we can kind of start to wrap our minds around those first two persons, perhaps more so than the third, at least if you're like me. If not, then feel free to doze off for this bit. God, the person, the parent, the creator, and the spirit. And those first two, God the parent, right? God the father, the creator. This person makes the most sense to me, I think. For many, if not most monotheistic religions, have a God that is at least somewhat like ours, right? And then the second person, the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus. Well, he's probably easiest for us to figure out because as we have proclaimed, as he was with us, he was just as human as you or I or any other person has been. But that third person, the spirit, well, that one seems about as easy to pin down as the wind. Perhaps that's why if we look to our historic creeds and confessions, we'll often find that verbiage about the spirit is, well, 
rather lacking compared to the other two persons. It's like we're just not always very sure what to do with the quiet one. Now, for those of us in a more liturgical traditions like ours, I would suspect that we probably have a pretty good handle on the Pentecost story told in the book of Acts. But we might not be as familiar with the other New Testament takes on the Spirit. For instance, our story in John is not actually set on the day of Pentecost, as Jesus is talking about the one who is going to give. It actually happens all the way back toward the Last Supper as Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. This is, a, this is a text in John known as the farewell discourse. And the spirit herself, unlike in the other three gospels, doesn't make an appearance on the 50th day coming down as sort of tongues of flame as we're celebrating all over the place today, but rather in John happens on Easter as Jesus gives the spirit to his disciples. And so for a bit on this Pentecost Sunday, I invite you to come back with me to that upper room on that night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested by the empire. Jesus is preparing to leave. He's saying his goodbyes. He's having his sort of, don't forget to do this and always make sure that you turn off the oven and have your keys with you and lock your door on the way out and don't forget to call your parents. He's having that talk with them. And here, to kind of help them feel a little bit better about the fact that, at least from their perspective, they're, they're going to be abandoned by Jesus as he is intentionally walking towards his death in the hands of the empire in order to return from whence he came. To comfort them in the midst of that, Jesus tells them about this companion from the parent that he is sending to be with them. He's sending the Holy Spirit to be a comforter to them in their time of grief and sorrow to be an advocate for them as they wade into the troubled waters of a world that hates that overturning love that they have to show, and to be wisdom for them as they seek to find their way. Stepping behind our text for a moment and kind of putting on my instructor hat, if you will, John is including this in his narrative about Jesus because, well, frankly, his community is getting antsy. Where is Jesus anyway? Jesus was supposed to be back in glory to do all of that good overturning and inbreaking reign of God stuff that they had all been expecting. And yet here they were, a good lifetime after Jesus and his disciples walked those streets to Jerusalem, and he's not back yet. And they're worried. They're fretting. Perhaps they're experiencing a similar grief and sorrow as the original disciples did those decades earlier. Have we been abandoned? Why would Jesus do this to us? Doesn't Jesus love us? And so John reminds his community that even though Jesus remains seated at the right hand, there is another, the Spirit our comforter and counselor and advocate. And then church, we cut to some 19th centuries or so later. And it's wonderful that we are called to see Jesus in the face of our neighbor in need. And it's great that we can trust that Jesus is with us whenever two or more of us are gathered, even if just over Zoom. And it's amazing that we have the privilege of occasionally participating in that holy meal, partaking in and even becoming Christ's body for the world around that table. But we know that he is not fully back yet, at least not in the ways that matter for those who suffer, for the vulnerable and the oppressed, for those who are hungry and poor and those who have very little, if any, hope. And in the midst of this great absence, we, the church, struggle to figure things out. How do we remain faithful in this time in between? And sometimes we do a really good job of it, don't we? And we are known by our fruits of justice and love. But also, quite often, we fail and we fail hard. We, and I'm using the big we sort of universal church W here. 
We have hurt and still hurt people in Jesus' name. We have and still conquer and colonize peoples in Jesus' name. We have and still conflate conventional wisdom with holy writ. We have and still baptize the the empire as God's infallible rule in the world. And we have and still relied upon our wisdom rather than the wisdom that Jesus offered his disciples. We measure faithfulness in terms of quantifiable metrics like line items and people in the pews. And we fall upon words of comfort, but never challenge. We have and still expect the church to embody and maintain the status quo, even the status quo of white supremacy. But is that what Jesus would have the big you, us, do? Is that what the spirit is calling us to? More of the same. Friends, our text this morning promises that the gift of the Spirit who is among us is still speaking like that still small voice in the midst of a hurricane, still blowing where it will like the wind, still about as controllable as a wild goose. And that Spirit continues to be sent to us to show the world that it was wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, what might John mean about that, and how might that have any relationship to what we're doing today? Well, Randall Zachman, in his commentary on this text, points out that the love of God that we are to embody and express is so often seen by our world as an attack on it. That overturning love that God has for the world, that God's yes to the world's no, that love that we are part of is not going to make things easier for the followers of Jesus. For we, the disciples now as then, will find ourselves in conflict with a world that is not really interested in God's meddling ways. We would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you pesky God and Jesus fellows to completely take Eddie Izzard out of context. Anyway, the commentator writes, quote, The spirit does not protect the disciples from the hatred of the world, but further provokes it by attacking the very values by which the world secures for itself its highest life and meaning. The greatest sin is not to violate the laws and ideals that the human community devises for itself, but to reject the love of God in Christ, which calls us out of the world to seek our security in the love of God alone. Righteousness is not vindicated by success and achievement in this world, but is found in the apparent defeat of Christ in his death, whereby he returns to the Father. Judgment is not the future vindication of the world's laws and ideals over and against its enemies, but rather the decisive defeat of the adversary of God, accomplished already in the crucifixion of Christ." End quote. The ruler of the world, to use John's title, has already been defeated. However, that defeat falls under that elusive category of already but not yet. And the world still continues to struggle against the love that condemns its wisdom, whether in the sort of nimbying attempts to stop building housing for the homeless or it's screeching socialism every time somebody rightly points out that while one in five children will face hunger in the United States this year, we also have billionaires who are hoarding significantly more wealth than the dragon smog from The Hobbit. As a very nerdy aside, Forbes actually estimated that smog was sleeping on approximately $8.6 billion in gold, which while that makes him much richer than Governor Pritzker, makes him about 21 times poorer than Jeff Bezos. As an interesting aside. When the church takes up the struggles that it is called to, actually showing the love of God for everyone, proclaiming that black lives matter, proclaiming that transgender kids lives matter, that housing and healthcare and safety and meaningful work and education should not be privileges just for the very few who can afford it especially in a nation that likes to spend trillions of dollars on coming up with new and interesting ways to hurt people, 
then the church is following the spirit. When on a much smaller level, individual churches step out in faith to, to try something new or to express this great love in ways that they haven't done before that might feel uncomfortable or scary, they are following the spirit. Friends, in our time of transition, from which I have been so grateful to have spent almost two years having the privilege of walking alongside you with, we have been trying to be intentional about doing not only that kind of discerning of the spirit to find out who God is going to call us to be our next pastor, but to discern who we are called to be as well. For our, who our neighbors need us to be now not who our neighbors needed us to be a generation ago, for those things are different. And if we are to continue to remain a faithful people, we must of course follow where we are led, not where we have always been. Church on this Pentecost, instead of hearing the story that we probably know in our, born, in our bones, let us hear afresh from wisdom herself and be reminded that the spirit while comforting us in our distress and counseling us in our confusion, remains just as elusive and wild and dangerous as she always has been. One of our, one of my, well, a professor at McCormick when I was there, I didn't take anything from him, Claudio Carvales reminds us that, quote, Pentecost is a call for the church to live in the full power of the spirit, not in the power of budgets, programs, personal peaceful interiority, or a sort of consumer self-realization. Rather, it is a call to act upon our inward and outward selves together. As the prophet Micah reminds us, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, end quote. Happy birthday, church. Amen. Let us come together, friends, for our morning prayers. If you're with us over Zoom, feel free to add any further prayer requests you may have through the chat function. In the spirit of the first believers, we are called to share our goods in common and contribute to the needs of the poor with glad and generous hearts. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth.
God of all good gifts, it is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Please accept and use our offerings for your glory and in service to your reign. Amen. Friends, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Let us go forth from this place, shining forth in brilliant life, light, and overflowing with the love the Spirit has gifted to us. Amen. Mm -hmm.